Hey everyone, and welcome to Moments of Hope Church Online. I'm Jen Houston. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We have so much happening in the life and ministry of Moments of Hope Church. We don't want you to miss anything. Check out momentsofhopechurch.org slash events for everything that we have going on. I'd like to highlight for you two new things that have been added to our calendar. The first is September 11th. David is going to be teaching once a month to the men. He's kicking off a series called Eight Great Ways to Act Like a Man. Check out details and register for this because there is limited capacity on our website. Also on September 25th, Soul Circles, which is a meeting for women to come and be inspired. Marilyn is going to be teaching and you're going to hear from other hopesters about the power of testimony. Again, that's going to be on September 25th at Providence Square. For details on these events and more, please visit momentsofhopechurch.org slash events. Now, we have the great honor of being able to worship our risen and living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace a god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin in
Hi, everyone. In in case you don't know, I'm David Chadwick, and I just wanted to alert you that after my sermon today, uh, we're going to partake of communion online. So you might now, before the service begins, uh, get a cracker or a piece of bread, uh, get some grape juice or some water. Um, It doesn't matter how specific it is. What is important that you have some elements that I can bless in the name of Jesus and you can ingest. So before the service begins, you might want to go get that so that you can have ready at the end of my message to have us all experience and enjoy communion together. God bless you. Now let us worship the living Lord Jesus Christ. What I want to do today is continue this series on the church is essential. We have 
two uh, sermons that have already been done. The first one by my son, David, who did such an excellent job asking the question that Jesus asked his disciples at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, who do you say that I am? And your answer to that question, dear friends, determines your eternal salvation. The church is essential. Uh, It's crazy that during COVID, we had things like massage parlors and ABC stores remain open, but the church was closed because it was considered non-essential. Well, we've seen the rise in suicides and depressions, et cetera, since COVID's been lifted uh, because the church was not there to meet people's needs at the deepest levels of their heart. So we believe that the church is essential, and the way you enter the church of Jesus Christ is by answering that question, who do you say Jesus is? If you have concluded that he is the Christ sent by God the Father in heaven to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, you have now the entry point into the church. There's only one qualification necessary for joining the church of Jesus Christ, and that is a public profession of faith that you believe Jesus is Lord. If you have decided Jesus is just a mere teacher, a good human being, a good moral man, and he's not Lord of the universe, didn't die on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, you are at At this point, eternally separated from the Father, and you need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. But we'll stop there with those who have received Jesus as Lord and Savior and say that's the entry point into the life of the church. Now, for all of us who have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, the next step is to join, be a part of the church. Uh, The word is ekklesia in the Greek, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. It means the called out people of God who gather together to worship and hear the word of the Lord. So the next step is to be a part of a body of Christ, uh, the army of God, the family of God, uh, the bride of Christ, all those different images we talked about last week for the church. The church is essential, and you need, as a follower of Jesus, to be a part of a local body of Christ. Now, the visible church are those churches all over the world that gather together to worship and praise and to serve. That's the visible body of Christ. The invisible body of Christ is that which is within you, and that means all the people who love Jesus are part of the invisible church for which Jesus will return one day. It is the church triumphant because we know we have our lives in Christ, and we are able through him to overcome all sin, death, the devil, and have our eternal life guaranteed when Jesus does return. Now, there's Two other things that happen in the church that we're going to talk about today that are essential for the life of the believer. Two things called baptism and communion. Now, baptism has been called by some churches an ordinance. That means it's commanded, and I think it is commanded. It's not necessary for salvation, for if you die uh, in the middle of a desert and have the gospel proclaimed to you and you don't have the chance to go be immersed in water, it's grace that saves you. It's not grace plus water baptism. It's not grace plus anything else. It's just grace by which you are saved. So it is, though, commanded, though, as an efficacious part of your life. It is your one public declaration of your faith, uh, but it's also a chance for you to go under the water, die to self, come out of the water, be alive in Christ. And on those days when you doubt whether you really did receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and folks, I've walked with Jesus for well over a half a century, and there are those days that Jesus becomes not as real as others. There are days when uh, I'm dark in my own flesh and I don't really understand who Jesus is as clearly as I do in other days. But, you know, when those days happen, what do I do? I remember my baptism. I remember that day when I went under the water and chose by my own volition to die to self and come out of that water and be raised to new life in Christ. I made that decision. And when I restate that decision, it's interesting that darkness starts to lift. So the baptism is efficacious for everyone around you, your family, your friends, hearing you say, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. But it's also helpful for your soul that on those dark days when you are having trouble just living your life in Christ, it helps you remember what you did and that new life in Christ will become alive to you again. So you have entered the church of Jesus, and now we're going to practice the ordinance, the command of baptism and communion. But we also need to realize that both of these in something called the Reformed tradition, the Presbyterian tradition, is beyond just an ordinance. It's called a sacrament. And the word sacrament means a special sense of God's holy presence 
in those elements. Uh, in fact, as we look at baptism and communion today, I'm going to explain to you the different views on communion. But before I do that, let's look at baptism because this Sunday at Moments of Hope Church, we're going to have well over 20 baptisms. They're going to be children who've made that decision. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And yes, children can make that decision. In fact, in Isaiah, in a prophecy, it says a child will lead you. Uh, we have evidence is through history that, for example, in the Indonesian revival, it was a kid about 10 years of age who gave his life to Jesus, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he led a revival in that whole nation that brought thousands upon thousands upon thousands to Jesus. So yes, children can absolutely walk with the Lord. Children can absolutely infect their schools for Jesus. Children can absolutely be powerful instruments of Jesus in their lives. And they can make evidence to that commitment they have made in the infilling of the Holy Spirit by baptisms as well. But also teens will give their lives to Jesus and express it through baptism this weekend. We'll also have a number of adults do so. Some numbers of kids who are in Bart Noonan's ministry. Bart's one of our hopesters who has started a powerful ministry on the west side of town in one of those vulnerable communities. And he has been witnessing to young boys especially because he knows that when young boys get healthy, there's the potential for young families later on to be healthy with good fathers. And he has invited them to receive Jesus, and they have said yes, and they're going to be baptized as well. So they're going to be kids, they're going to be teens, they're going to be adults, all saying, I have decided to follow Jesus and be baptized. So let's look at baptism from a biblical perspective and why, again, it is important. Well, first of all, uh, Jesus said so. In, in Mark 1.15, Jesus said, For the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and be baptized. Now, now notice that not only with Jesus in Mark uh, 1.15, but also in Acts 2.38, when Peter preached his Pentecost sermon, remember the disciples received Jesus, knew who he was, the Spirit was poured out on them, and they came together in the church. And in Acts 2, Peter proclaims the gospel to thousands upon thousands, and he says to them, repent and be baptized and believe that Jesus is Lord. He was dead on the cross, raised from the dead by the power of God, repent and be baptized. So that same message that Jesus used, repent and be baptized, is the same message that Peter used when 3,000 were saved in one preaching experience. I can't imagine how wonderful that moment must have been for him and for the early church. Well, let's just talk for a second. Uh, you are not only to be baptized, but baptism is the sign and symbol that you are repenting. You're repenting of your past life. You're moving away from that. You're saying, no more am I going to live in that godlessness, in that darkness of the kingdom of the devil. I am choosing by my own volition to come out of that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And the way now I live my life is proof of that change. Now, the word repentance also means change of thinking, uh, way of thinking transformation. And when you think rightly, folks, your behavior will soon follow. When you have right, right beliefs, right behavior will soon follow. When you have the right thoughts, you will do the right thing. So baptism and repentance are naturally connected. If you are giving your life to Jesus, you then naturally repent of that old life. Uh, you have new views in your life toward when life begins in the womb, what marriage is, what gender is, the repentance from slander and gossip. You no longer want to be prideful and arrogant, but humble before the Lord. Uh, all of those things were a part of your old life. You have now this new life in Christ. That's what repentance is. So Jesus said, repent and be baptized. Both are a part of the baptism experience. If you're just being baptized and try to live your old life again and again, Jesus will deal with you at some point. So repent and be baptized. It was a command. Bapto is the word that's used there for baptism. It means in other places in the scripture, it's used, for example, of taking a piece of linen and dyeing it completely in a color to change the color of the garment. Well, when you dip it under the dye, that is bapto. Uh, so when you go in the water, that's why we do total immersion baptism. Uh, the word bapto, baptizo, 
Baptism is the same word, and it means to go under the water completely and totally. Uh, So we will see this Sunday numbers of people go under the water, dying to self and coming out of it for new life. Uh, We also see uh, an interesting insight into baptism in Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three and four. Uh, Let me read these verses to you. They are powerful insights into what baptism really is. Paul wrote to the church at Rome, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that in Christ we're raised also from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So what is baptism? It is going under the water and dying to self. It's dying to sin. Um, You're not only guaranteed eternal life by receiving Jesus. That's wonderful. By grace, we've been saved. We now have citizenships in heaven. We are forever forgiven. That's wonderful. But people don't talk enough about going under that water is not only the death to self, like Jesus died on the cross. It's being dead to sin. It's dead to the power of sin. That the lusts of the flesh that previously guided your life, you're now dead to them. It's like nerve endings have been soldered, and you no longer feel that urge to sin and to do things that don't glorify God. And so you go under the water, dying to self, and you die to the desires of sin. Then you come out of the life being raised with Jesus to eternal life and to this new life in resurrection power that Jesus has given to us. So baptism is a reflection of what Paul is describing in Romans 6, 3, and 4. Then the question comes, well, well, who should baptize me? And I find it very interesting. For example, a lot of people think that uh, Jesus baptized a lot of people because uh, he was baptized by John the Baptist. And, and, you know, Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He's sinless. So people ask the question a lot, well, why in the world did Jesus get baptized by John the Baptist? And it was not, folks, because he needed to be forgiven of his sins. Again, he is the sinless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the perfect God-man who never, ever sinned. That's why he could pay the price for our sins on the cross. His perfection allowed him to die in our place. But he died. He went to the baptism experience not because he needed to, but because he knew we needed to. He was giving us an identity with our sin, showing us what we needed to do in order to move into the kingdom of God. So 2 Corinthians 5.21, where Paul writes, he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, the sinless lamb of God, became sin. On the cross, he took all of the sins of the world upon himself so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So baptism is the reflection of us receiving Jesus, dying to self, coming out of the water to new life in him. And Jesus went through that experience so that we would do so as well. Again, it's his identity in death and in the newness of life with us. Uh, And we see that clearly uh, in him being baptized by John. And when he was the The third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, came upon him, and we hear the first person of the Godhead, God the Father, saying to the second person of the Godhead, God the Son, you are my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So in the baptism of Jesus, you see the Trinity. Yes, the word Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible, uh, but never is the word Bible but it's the Word of God. So so we have uh, in the understanding of the Trinity, uh, in the baptism of Jesus, uh, the Son was baptized, had the Holy Spirit come upon him, and the Father spoke to him, I'm well pleased with your life that is perfect in every possible way. So we have the question then, uh, did Jesus then baptize a lot of people as well? And here is what's so interesting. In John chapter one, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that uh, Jesus was um, making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. 
Uh, so there was a question, is Jesus the one out there baptizing all the people? And John makes it clear, Jesus did not baptize anyone. Well, why? If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you will see that Paul talks about all the divisions that were happening in the church at Corinth, and it was largely over who baptized whom. And Paul does list the certain people whom he had baptized, but then it's interesting, he backs off and says, I'm not baptizing many people anymore. And and many people have asked through the ages, what's Paul doing here? He baptized a good number, and people were bragging that, you know, Cephas, Peter baptized me, Paul baptized me, Apollos baptized me, and there was division in the church over kind of celebrity pastors, if you will, that this guy is more important than that guy. And Paul just makes it clear, I'm baptizing less and less because I don't want to be the center of attention. The center of attention with the baptism is Jesus. So interestingly, Jesus didn't baptize anyone. Paul backed off from doing it. And you need to know this Sunday, I'm not going to baptize anybody. In the four plus years in the life and history of Moments of Hope Church, I baptized most everyone. It's now time for me to back off and that people realize it's not about David. I don't want to be a superstar pastor, folks. I don't want to be a celebrity pastor. That is not my heart. That's not my desire. I just want to be a humble servant of Jesus. And the longer I am in ministry, the more I want to live by John 3.30, which John the Baptist said about Jesus may I decrease, may he increase. I I just want to decrease in my emphasis, and I want to point to Jesus and have him increase in every possible way. So, So who should baptize you? It doesn't matter because people are being baptized as Jesus commanded in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples, uh, teaching them all that I have commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're being baptized into Jesus. He's the superstar. Jesus is the celebrity pastor. And as you're being baptized into him, he is the one who receives all the glory forever and ever. You're baptized in a Trinitarian formula in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons, you're baptized in his name, and Jesus gets all the glory. And that's what needs to be emphasized more and more. Uh, Also, we're inviting dads to come into the baptismal pool as well. Why is that? We'll get into more of this next week, but the home and the family are a microcosm of the macrocosm of the church. And I believe with all my heart, the scripture teaches it that the father is supposed to be the spiritual leader of his home. He's supposed to be the pastor to his wife and to his children. Um, I believe we'll get to communion in just a second. Uh, You dads can serve communion to your kids and in your family in a regular way. And there are going to be several dads in the pool when their kids get baptized with one of our pastors, taking them under the water, dying to self, coming out of the water to the new life in Christ. And man, folks, if you've not seen what happens between a dad and a son and daughter after this happens, whew, man, you should see it. I had it happen when my Michael was baptized when he was like 12 years old, and I took him under the water and brought him out. And I have a picture at home of us hugging right after that happened. What a powerful moment that I His dad and also his pastor had the privilege of baptizing him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there are some insights into baptism, what it means. And if you've not been baptized, you need to be. If you love Jesus, if you've confessed him as Lord and Savior, you need to be baptized. I'm asked a lot, what if I was baptized as an infant? Well, that has to do with Reformed theology and the Presbyterian tradition. Uh, It means that you had your parents make a covenant for you and believed for you that one day you would receive Jesus. And if you've received Jesus. The whole teaching is you can claim your infant baptism. I'm not going to argue that point. I hope you can explain that tacitly and easily. If people ask you why you've chosen not to be baptized as an adult, um, I would encourage you, though, to have that be your own experience because there will be dark days when you don't understand all that's going on and you can reclaim your baptism. You can't remember your infant baptism. That's something your parents chose for you. Praise God. I understand Reformed theology. I was schooled in it, but I've also come to understand the power of adult baptism. That is your chosen profession when you choose to follow Jesus. And I would encourage all of you who are watching right now, if you've not been immersed baptism as an adult, as a 
professing believer in Jesus, that you allow that to happen one day in your life. Now, let's move to communion. So baptism is an ordinance commanded by God. I think it's a sacrament as well. I think Jesus is powerfully, invisibly, mysteriously present when that new believer goes under the water and comes out of it. Your life is in him, connected to him, and he's especially present. I think the same thing is with communion. And in the Bible, Jesus said, as often as you drink this blood and eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. How often should we do communion? Well, as often as we feel like it's appropriate. In Moments of Hope Church, we do it once a month. Uh, We don't want to do it every week. We think it becomes old and stayed at that point with many of us, but we do think it should be at least once a month because it is a reminder and a powerful experience of our new life in Christ. Now, in the history of the church, there are three understandings of communion. Uh, First of all, it's a remembrance service. This is more of the Baptistic tradition, if you will. Maybe uh, independent churches feel more this way. Uh, It is an ordinance that's commanded, and we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross and what happened with his resurrection. And that's what Jesus meant when he commanded his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, Some traditions call The Lord's table, the Eucharist, uh, that word eucharisto in the Greek means to give thanks. So you are remembering all that Jesus has done for you. You give thanks for that, but especially his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead that guarantees you the gift of eternal life. That's one perspective on communion. The second perspective is called transubstantiation. It's more of the Roman Catholic tradition, if you will, and it believes that the body and the blood, the wine and the bread are actual substances that become uh, the body and the blood of Jesus. And they say this because Jesus said when he uh, gave the elements to his own disciples in what is said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is my body, this is my blood. And, And those who don't believe that transubstantiation is true, that the bread and the wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus, say, well, Jesus also said, you know, I am the door, Uh, but he was not actually a door uh, in John 10. So there are metaphors and similes used often in the Scripture. And so these folks uh, would say, no, it's not the actual body and blood of Jesus, which leads to the third possibility, and that basically is called consubstantiation in a fancy theological term. And that means that somehow, mysteriously, powerfully, Uh, The Holy Spirit is present in the elements. We can't explain it. We just understand it. And when we partake of the body and blood of Jesus, there's a mysterious presence of Jesus that reminds us of our co-union life with Jesus. That's why communion is called communion, com, the Latin word with, union. You are having union life with Jesus in that very specific, powerful moment. So let me just read to you some verses. From Ephesians chapter 1. Remember I told you that Ephesians is the book about the church? And when individual believers follow Jesus, they then become a part of other believers, the body of Christ. Now now listen to these words in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, look, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So to the praise of his glorious grace, which which he has blessed us in the beloved, verse seven, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Don't you love that? That God in Christ lavished his grace upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which is in Christ. Now, I just paused there. I could keep on going and list others, but For every time in the Bible, it says that Christ uh, lives in us, which is important. Jesus lives in us. Wow, the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. There are three more times it says that we live in him. That's what Jesus meant in John 15, 7, when he said, abide in me and 
I'll abide in you. And if you abide in me and I abide in you, you can ask anything to the Father. It means that he lives in us and we live in him and he speaks to us and we can hear his voice. It is just an amazing reality. That's what the Christian life is all about. So what is communion? For me, I am not a transubstantiationist like the Roman Catholics. I, I don't believe the bread and the wine become the actual body and blood of Jesus. I can remember doing a wedding one time with a priest in a Catholic church, and after the wedding service where he served communion to the bride and the groom, we went back and were changing our clothes, and he actually drank all of the, the grape juice that was left, all of the bread that was left, because he said, this has been wholly blessed, only a priest can eat of it. And I thought to myself, well, I don't believe that it's the actual body and blood of Jesus, but, you know, we're still brothers in Christ, and I'm going to go ahead and move forward with our being able to disagree on this. But I believe there is a remembrance service that we need to have with communion. I, need, I believe also that it is consubstantiated. It is the presence of Jesus' blood and body. And then when we ingest it, 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 it somehow empowers us in this union life with Jesus to remember not only what he did, to give thanks for that, but also have an experience with him that empowers us in our born-again reality to have his spirit give us strength and keep moving forward. And I think that idea of communion is very, very important. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 32, you'll also see a reality of what is taught about communion. May I read these verses to you as well? For Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. There's where people get the transubstantiation idea. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Notice how often when, when, how often you want to do that in the church or at home in your family, or I think you can serve communion to yourself and receive that new life in Jesus on a regular basis. That's my belief. Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. So if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. So, so what is Paul teaching here? We take communion, but the first thing we do is we examine ourselves. And if you say you love Jesus and you're still living in an ungodly, unrepentant fashion, if Jesus has not molded your mind to believe what he believes, you know, just like a loving father will discipline his children to get them to believe rightly because he knows ultimately it's destructive if they choose this path, um, when you wrongly eat and wrongly drink of the elements without a heart of repentance, and you're still living a life that is far away from God, Jesus will discipline you. And many of you, Paul said, are ill and sick because you have not gone to the table. And then the other side of this is that if you do it rightly, there's a power of the Holy Spirit in that union life that just might heal your body, that just might heal your soul, that just might give your spirit new life and hope and blessing. It's just a powerful statement for us to realize. It's the same kind of thing like with baptism. Repent and be baptized. Be baptized, but make sure it is accompanied by repentance. And it's the same thing here. Take communion, but make sure you're repenting and living a life that Jesus wants you to live. You know, there's a verse in uh, the Corinthians that says, godly sorrow with repentance is great gain. And just make sure if you're sorry for your sin, there's also repentance where you change your life. Uh, don't be sorry that you got caught be sorry and quit doing it. I think that's an important message for all of us here today. So you see in communion, there are three things that happen. First of all, there is a past remembrance. 
you remember what Jesus did for you, and you give thanks for that. You remember what Jesus did, and you give thanks for that. Secondly, you, there's a present reality of Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's living with you no matter what you face. And thirdly, there is a future reality. Did you catch that? In Luke 22, Jesus said as well, you keep on eating and drinking this until Jesus returns again. Jesus said in Luke 22, more specifically, that to his disciples, I won't partake of these elements with you around this table until I come again. But when he does come again, there's going to be a renewal of celebration around the table, the wedding feast of the Lamb, something glorious and magnificent beyond anything we could ever hope for or imagine. So, dear friends, continue to trust in Jesus to whom you gave your life. You've realized that he is the Lord. Uh, Secondly, be a part of a church because you need one another to keep moving forward. And also continue to celebrate in your church's life the ordinances and the sacraments of baptism and communion. They are two gifts and commands that Jesus gave his church to continue to practice this day and forever. To God be the glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to give everybody at home the chance to take communion. Um, Obviously, you can't be a part publicly of the baptismal services here this Sunday, but we can take communion online. So let me see if I can lead you through this rightly. If you could get something that's liquid, uh, some juice or water would work or whatever. It doesn't matter. It is a symbol of something more powerful. Uh, Maybe get a piece of bread or get a cracker or something like this. And let me now take you through communion so that we can all do this together. The first thing I'll ask you to do is to take a few moments and let the Holy Spirit examine your heart. Is there any inconsistency in your life of you saying Jesus is Lord and what you believe and or are practicing. Let the Holy Spirit examine you. Is is there any recurring lust of the flesh that's popping up in your life? You with me? So now pray with me. Father in heaven, in Jesus' wonderful name, by the power of your Spirit, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to examine my heart, and I've been able to discern a couple of places where there's an inconsistency with what I say I believe and who I am and how I'm living. So I'm asking you right now to come and, first of all, forgive me anew. And I'm committing to you, Lord, that I want, like my baptism, to die to that area in my life and to let it have no more power and authority over me. I want to die to that sin. I want you to solder the nerve cords of that lust of my flesh so that I don't feel any attraction, any desire to do that ever again. And Lord, I'm asking for your forgiveness anew. And any of the rest of you out there who can't identify anything particularly, but you're just saying again to the Lord, my life is yours. I have a co-union life with you. And why this communion is so important to me. Come now, Lord, and encourage me as I face different things in my life, physical setbacks, job issues, relational problems. Lord, I just need your strength to help me deal with life. So I now ready my heart to receive your grace anew. In Jesus' name. So on the night that the Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. As you eat this, realize it's Jesus' broken life, death on his cross shed for you that's giving you that new life in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your death, your cross, your broken body, helping me with my broken places to give me hope. In Jesus' name, amen. In a similar way, Jesus took 
grape juice, wine, water, whatever you have, poured it into a cup and said, this is my blood shed for you. Dear friends, life is in the blood, Leviticus 17. We can't live without blood. And our blood's been polluted by sin. But Jesus' death on the cross shed perfect, unblemished blood so that as we drink this, remembering our union life in Jesus, we know that our polluted blood that causes death has been invigorated and cleansed by Jesus' blood, which is pure and grants me, grants us eternal life. Drink in remembrance of him. There's power in the blood. The blood renews, the blood heals, the blood gives life in our mortal bodies. Lord, how much more in your resurrected body? We ingest now the body and now your blood, knowing that your new blood forgives us of sins and that when that day comes that these earthly bodies die, the new blood in Jesus will empower our resurrection bodies and lives and we live in that reality today and forever. So thank you, Jesus, that we have rightly partaken of the body and blood of Jesus, examining ourselves and receiving new strength, new power. And I pray somebody right now is getting healed of a disease. I'm praying... Someone right now is given new life in a hopeless, despairing situation. I'm praying somebody out there right now knows that you are Lord of the universe and they therefore need fear nothing. And I pray through the partaking of these elements together in your church called Moments of Hope Church, that through baptism in our live worship, through communion live and online, people are set free in the power of your spirit, in the love of Jesus. Thank you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, David. This week's Hope Gift is an acknowledgement of a gift that we were able to give earlier this year. One of our very own Hopesters, Bart Noonan, has a ministry called West Boulevard Ministries. He serves right here in our backyard, right in Charlotte, to the least and to the lost. And we are so grateful for Bart and all that you do to pour yourself out, be the hands and feet of Jesus, right here in Charlotte. Earlier this year, we were able to give Bart $50,000 to complete a facility that is now up and running. We are so grateful for you pouring your life out right in our city, Bart, and we pray that your ministry is blessed and will flourish. And if you would like to sow into our ministry today, you can give through our website, through our app, or you can mail a check to 4500 Cameron Valley Parkway, Suite 400, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28211. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and we hope to see you next week.